So I think um, so there are still a few people joining, but I think we'll get started. So welcome everybody who's joined this um, Zoom call, uh, where we're going to um, reflect on the uh, the COP28 and perspectives on a just energy transition. Obviously, today is the opening um, of the COP28 conference in Dubai. Um, and what we're looking at doing today is providing some of the perspectives around that that uh, that 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 event that's happening, obviously bringing in the perspectives from um, three three institutions that are really, but they all have delegates going to COP, but actually what we wanted to do was to represent the fact that it's that, that there's a lot of uh, local conversations that could be have we could be having that are really meaningful and can contribute just as meaning meaningfully to the discussion. So this this event is co-hosted by the University of Plymouth, University College Cork, and University of Massachusetts Lowell, and we're really delighted to have three uh, speakers who are going to sort of set the scene um, for us today, talking around those that that topic. Um, but obviously, yes, I said that the framing is that we've got the launch of COP28 today in Dubai. Um, and one of the key um, thematics that's going to be addressed at COP is that thematic of the just energy transition. So one of the things we were wanting to do today is to, to think about what that might mean. Um, and one of the ways we're going to frame that is um, talking about what our hopes or aspirations might be for COP and keeping that around three ideas or three hopes or wishes for COP28. Um, so at some point, we're going to ask for a little bit of audience participation. So if you're here, hopefully you're willing to, to get involved and um, would like to sort of also bring in your own viewpoints. Um, in terms of the format, we're going to have about um, 10 minutes for each speaker, um, and then we'll have about half an hour for discussion and questions and also to bring in the reflections about your hopes for COP28 for the people that have joined us. I was just going to um, pick up on what the EU has highlighted as its uh, aspirations for COP28. They want tripling of global renewable energy capacity and doubling energy efficiency improvement rates by 2030. They want reaching agreement on phasing out anabetic fossil fuels, making sure that fossil fuel consumption peaks ahead of 2030, and phasing out fossil fuel subsidies that do not address energy poverty or the just transition. So that really picks up on the, the thematic we've chosen today around the just energy transition. Um, and, and I'd like to hand over now, first of all, to Professor Brian, Brian Gallagher from UCC Cork. And then following that, we'll have uh, Dr. Munira Rajiv from the University of Plymouth. And finally, Professor Juliet Nicola, Nicola, Nicola Vune Varga from UCC Lowell. So I'll hand over now to um, Professor Gallagher, who, who will um, do our first introductory talk, um, talking about his aspirations for COP. And, I will just briefly um, pick up on, we've, we've got a Slido and a Mentimeter. So if you'd like to log into those, the details should be in the chat and we'll pick on those, pick up on those after the, the talks. So Brian, I shall hand over to you and thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be here on the, the first day of, uh, of this important uh, and also controversial uh, COP meeting. Um, it, it was interesting to see in the news um, concerns over the leadership of COP28 this year and um, the, the types of deals that might be struck uh, or not struck uh, during the the event, because um, it's 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 a challenging one, I think, in the context that the, the United Arab Emirates, who are hosting, uh, have high ambitions uh, correctly for this year's COP, um, but they have been um, uh, blemished, I think, by some of the um, the media reporting on uh, kind of fossil fuel deals that are hoped to be um, struck. Uh, that will not align with uh, what our hopes or aspirations uh, might be, but we'll, we'll go in the opposite direction. Um, and, and that brings me to the first of my uh, hopes for the um, uh, the few days, uh, well, the, the two weeks uh, in uh, COP28. Um, this is a, a unique one of all the, the COP meetings because it's the first uh, COP that will um, effectively hear about the first global stock take. Uh, this was a part of the Paris Agreement uh, agreed in 2015, COP21 in Paris. Um, part of the agreement uh, was that there would be a, um, a regular global stock take and then effectively countries would be asked to um, explain 
what additional measures they will be introducing uh, in order to address any imbalance between what comes out of the global stock take and where we should be in the context of our ambitions uh, to remain within a 1.5 degree uh, world. So this global stock take, it will confirm what we already know, uh, that the transition is underway globally, but not fast enough, not nearly fast enough to align with the goals of the Paris Agreement. And so this does raise an important question for this COP, which is, so what now um, that global leaders will need to respond to? Um, and one of the key challenges has been a resistance to, to deal with the question of to, to directly deal with the question of fossil fuels and the need to phase out fossil fuels uh, globally. There was um, a couple of years ago at COP26 in Glasgow, there was an attempt to bring in uh, fossil fuels into the uh, text of the uh, agreement from that COP meeting. And that was reduced to uh, unabated coal uh, was the compromise that was achieved then. So. So my first hope will be that there will be something much more significant uh, in terms of agreement in the text uh, from this COP meeting uh, on a united approach to, to the phasing out of fossil fuels. Uh, it's a big ask, I think, given the, the political resistance previously, um, given the hosts and, and their attachment to fossil fuels, uh, but they have also committed to this, that fossil fuels will be on the agenda. Um, so that's my first hope, that we would see uh, a strong and united approach uh, to at least rapidly reducing fossil fuels, if not a, a phase out. Um, the second relates to the just part of the just transition. Uh, and this is particularly, from my perspective, progress on loss and damages. Um, this is distinct from the, um, the climate finance, uh, which is also a very important topic. Um, but loss and damages, I, I think we, we've seen over the last 18 months in particular, the increased frequency of extreme weather events and the devastation caused by heat waves, storms and hurricanes, to name but a few of those types of extreme weather events around the world. Um, but in a lot of cases, these extreme weather events are happening in parts of the world that haven't contributed to climate change, to the problem of climate change. Um, and this uh, effectively reflects the, the, the strong injustice that's taking place with climate change. So progress on the funding associated with loss and damages is, is a key importance. Um, I, I was particularly proud last year to see Ireland's leadership role in negotiations of this in Egypt and it was one of the, the, the key and few enough positive outcomes from COP27. So it's, it's hugely important now that, that um, the progress made last year, that there's momentum built uh, this year and um, much more significant commitments in terms of who pays for the damage caused by, by climate change. Um, the third uh, of my hopes is probably one that will be achieved. It's probably the most likely to be achieved uh, of the ones that I'm, and that's why I mentioned it last. And this is the commitment to triple renewable energy by 2030. Um, the reason I think it's likely to be achieved is politically it's probably easier than the others. We are already on a very sharp uh, sort of trajectory of progress in renewable energy. And, uh, and it's backed up by recent reports, significant recent reports, two that I can um, mention specifically, the International Energy Agency, they recently published their World Energy Outlook. And they had the tripling of renewable energy and the doubling of energy efficiency by 2030. Now this is by 2030 as being key to the, the trajectories to, to remain within uh, a 1.5 degree world. Um, trajectories that include lots of other things. Um, but the commitment to, to triple renewable energy, as I say, is probably one that's more politically acceptable than some of the others. It still is a very ambitious target to set. And I think uh, having this short-term goal would provide the necessary impetus to deliver on it and, and to really accelerate um, uh, the deployment uh, of renewables. 
So there are my three. Just in summary, uh, a fossil fuel phase out, uh, significant progress on lasting damages and commitments to triple renewables by 2030. Thanks, Catherine. Back to you. Thank you, Brian. Um, really great to hear those three. And I'm going to hand over to Manira now for, from the University of Plymouth. So can you see my screen? Yes, it's fine. Ah, thank you. Okay. Um, I guess um um before I start my own three key expectation for COP twenty eight. Um, so last year I was um at COP twenty seven in uh, in Egypt, and um one of the things I noticed um having visited um a lot of the pavilion, especially the just transition pavilion and the Sustainable Energy for All uh, Pavilion, SDG of four, or for all, um, SDG seven pavilion rather. I I noticed um, talking to people and listening to some of the conversation that um, just transition means something different to everyone. Um, it, just transition means having access to affordable energy for people mostly in the global, global, global north. And then in, in some country in the global south, just transition means having, just seen having access to energy, not even the affordable, just seen having energy to be able to do things that we do take for granted here. So, um, so that sort of really helped me to, 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 to tailor the, the sort of work I do. So what I do is uh, mostly sort of so I'm a geologist by background, and um, I uh, I work on renewable energies. And uh, what I do is try to see how we can collaborate with uh, countries in the global south on how to develop um, uh, research and develop uh, their renewable energy uh, resources. So I'll uh, just move on to my um, uh, first expect. Oh yeah, before I before I move on to my three SK expectation, I just want to talk briefly about the issue of energy transition. So uh, before the industrial revolution, people relied on, on firewood, charcoal, dry manure, and muzzle power for energy. And then in the 19, 1959, uh, the first um, oil was discovered in the US, in, uh, in Pen uh, Pen Pennsylvania, in the US. But it wasn't until, uh, uh, until a century later that oil and gas became a very significant energy source. So, um, and then in the 1930s, there was um, a use of coal, uh, the, the, the use of coal increased because of uh, coal power plants everywhere. And so the first major energy transition actually occurred in the 1930s when coal became the dominant energy. And um, so that, then, then in, the, in 1960, there was a, 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 a bit more shift in, uh, in the use of oil and gas demand picked uh, that period because of uh, gasoline uh, vehicle and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, um, but gasoline vehicle used for and then energy global energy uh, demand uh, peaked around uh, around 1960. So um, so basically in the in, in, uh, in the 20th century, coal, oil, and gas became the dominant uh, energy sources. And then uh, came in 2015 when all country signed uh, committed to reducing their uh, carbon emission. Uh, and signed the Paris Agreement. And so today we, we have uh, renewable energy like uh, geothermal, wind, solar, becoming increasingly more important in, uh, in the global energy mix. So uh, the reason why I'm showing this is to, to say coal has be, uh, was, was the first um, energy, uh, primary energy source before the, uh, and, the, and was the first energy transition. And so many countries were left behind then because um, people, a lot of countries just, uh, uh, or uh, transition from one um, from from firewood to coal, from coal to oil, but a lot of countries were left behind during the first uh, major energy transition. So it's, in order to to sort of av avoid uh, not repeating the same situation again, we need to all work together. It's crucial that all countries must uh, work together this time around and not leave any country behind in the shift to renewable energy, because of uh, the the. the global energy transition, it's, 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 it's not just um, 
for countries in the in in, in the global south or in the global north, it's 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 essential that all countries must support the efforts by all the other countries to to reduce their carbon carbon footprint. So that's just to summarize why it is important that we must not leave um, any country or other people behind this um, for this uh, new energy transition. And so moving on to my um, my key expectation, which is um, my first expectation is for, for the COP this year to be a COP where the Global South and the Global North commit more to working closely to close the energy uh, poverty gap. Roughly around uh, 739, 733 million people live without electricity, and most of them are in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And um, so this lack of electricity denies people the economic and social opportunities that you and I uh, take for granted. For example, I'm able to log in to, uh, to, to join this Zoom today because I have uh, electricity in my home. And but, um, I'm originally from Nigeria where my people or my, my family will have to wait every, every uh, for two hours every day just to, to get access to electricity for just two hours or sometimes for, for a week, you wouldn't even get that for, for, for electricity at all. So um, a lot of opportunities, uh, a, a lot of, the lack of uh, electricity denies people the opportunities and uh, economic opportunities and social opportunities to, to, be, to be able to, to grow. So, and, and, and then again, around um, um, clean energy for cooking, about 2.3 billion people worldwide still rely on using charcoal, firewood, and animal dog for cooking. While um, that's the all uh, that's all they have access to because um, cooking or uh, clean using cooking uh, clean cooking is uh, expensive and or not accessible. So um, energy poverty don't doesn't just affect the earth of uh, the people or the economic or uh, stagnation. It affects education, economic prosperity, food security, or gender equality, and even jobs. So um, energy poverty, to me, is a security concern because without energy, it can lead to a lot of civil unrest in countries of, of, of poverty, or economic stagnation, environmental and geopolitical instability, and mass migration. There's been a lot of issue around mass migration to Europe as well. And then, of course, accelerated uh, climate change. So we must, um, I, I think uh, this COP should sort of try to prioritize ending energy poverty to be at the, at the central focus for a just transition. And uh, um, Africans should not be left behind in this um, energy transition this time around, because doing that would be, be completely un, uh, uh, unjust to, to do. And then um, Moving on to my second expectation, which is around a uh, people center um, energy transition. A people center energy transition has a um, different sort of integrated approach, which means um, governments at all levels should work hand in hand with local community to identify their energy mix and uh, develop or tailored solutions to specific uh, energy uh, problem they have. Um, so that, that means listening to the community, having, uh, uh, having them as, as part of the stakeholders and trying to uh, understand what their energy uh, 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 problem is and trying to solve that to solve uh, the specific problem they have. And then of course, um, that, this sort of approach will obviously enhance social development and economic progress, ensuring that uh, the well-being of the community and the most vulnerable people affected by climate change are taken seriously. And then um, workers' protection and empowerment. So protecting workers and empowering um, workers in legacy industry like coal, oil and gas. Um, I used to, uh, my, my background is in petroleum geoscience and I used to sort of work on around unconventional fracking. And, and so there are many people like that who or the uh, oil and gas, um, uh, 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 will work in the oil and gas industry or in the coal industry. So we need to make sure these people are protected in a way that we can uh, develop uh, effective training and support for them to sort of transition into renewable energy jobs or other sectors. And then of course, equipping the workforce of, of, the, of the future for this um, 
for example, in the UK, many universities have stopped offering petroleum geoscience degree and are not offering renewable energy and sustainable geoscience degree, like um, uh, Plymouth, for example, we offer a sustainable geoscience and renewable energy uh, uh, program. So this shift is because the changing priority of energy sectors have changed. And so we need more and more countries, especially in the global, global South, uh, needs to think about or, or retraining or, or, or equipping the future workforce to be able to, to work or, or, or adequately in the, um, in the renewable energy sector. And of course, um, engaging the youngest generations, uh, they have very, they're very passionate about the environment and about, about justice, about, about social uh, equality and all of that. So we need to make sure we equip them to be able to advocate uh, for the uh, to, to be able to advocate in the public and uh, with the government in in decision making and uh, to be able to uh, prioritize uh, how we need to uh, change our um, our our carbon of sorry to, to be able to change from carbon intensive uh, uh, energy system to more uh, renewable energy uh, or energy mix. And so we need to engage uh, younger generations and we need to, uh, uh, we need to um, do public and government advocacy for, for not just uh, the younger generation, for, for the community as well. So we need to make sure uh, the policy that the government uh, make this, uh, make around energy transition needs to be more inclusive and the community needs to be part of that sort of uh, inclusive um, policy making so they can have the, uh, the, the, the share knowledge that they, they were part of the process and they, 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 they're going to be able to work towards making sure the, uh, the, the energy uh, system works for their community. And then um, my final expectation is around uh, energy security and affordability. I said earlier, energy affordability means, uh, security and affordability means different things to different uh, uh, people. So the lack of um, affordable and reliable energy is the most significant obstacle for many people in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so um, that's where all the commitment, when you go to COP, like last year, when I went to uh, a lot of these uh, countries uh, stand last year, a lot of them made commitment, uh, they made pledges about changing their energy uh, uh, energy mix, uh, doing uh, research around that. But I've gone back to, to actually look at some of what they've done so far, and I really haven't seen any key progress around their yeah, commitment to uh, transition energy transition effort. So, uh, and, and, I, and I don't blame them because these countries, uh, this country in Sub-Saharan Africa, they, they actually committed to doing this, but they lack the uh, financial resources and techn technological cap cap capability to make um, this transition happen. So it's like asking somebody who is struggling to, to make ends meet, like somebody with, in, from low income um, a, a country that uses firewood or generator for electricity to stop using uh, that and transition to solar or, or, or hydropower. You can't ask people to transition from nothing so it's 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 that that's that's not going to happen. So um, and Africa, uh, uh, Africa has abundant renewable energy source, including uh, geothermal, wind, um, hydro, hydrogen, and even hydropower. But they don't have the most of these countries don't have the technology and innovation to be able to develop these source, sources or even do research around this. So uh, the uh, the reality of energy transition is different for for most countries in sub-Saharan Africa, and. Um, I recently read that the, 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 the percentage of renewable energy investments in Africa is just currently around 2%, which is very low. That's why uh, all of this uh, uh, renewable energy resources that's in Africa. So I guess my, my hope is that uh, this COP28 uh, people, we sort of focus more on addressing the disparity between developed and developing nations regarding the technology and the, the amount of investments. Which, which should obviously lead to talking about more collaboration and support for, for developing countries to, for, for the developed countries to be able to work more closely with uh, developing countries to be able to address their specific uh, technological need 
and tailored to their own economic capacity. It's not, it doesn't make sense to develop uh, expensive or uh, floating offshore wind technology, for example, when a lot of countries can't afford to be able to do that or even maintain that. So I guess uh, my, my, my main, my main uh, closing remark will be to, 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 for us to be able to close uh, the um, energy poverty gap between the global south and global north, we need to talk about uh, more collaboration, investment in uh, renewable energy technology to provide access training and capacity support and policy that encourages renewable energy adapt adaption in um, different countries. And we need to make sure it's all tailored to to different uh, the specific country. Uh, you can't do a lot of uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, the same renewable energy uh, uh, development you do in the UK in country like Malawi, for example. So I, I, I guess my 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 expectation is to be able to see uh, from next year, from, from before next COP, to be able to see a lot of improvement in sort of uh, collaborations around uh, renewable energy sources between countries. Thank you. Thank you, Manira. Um, really useful to hear that perspective. And I'm going to um, hand straight on to Juliet. Great. Hi. Um, so my name is Juliet Ernie Varga. I'm, I'm tuning in from the University of Massachusetts in Lowell in the United States. And yeah, I think I want to thank Manira for really providing us with some, and I don't know if we're going to, if we can stop the screen share, perhaps, is that, Sorry. Um, if, uh, for, for, for giving that kind of introduction and also a perfect really set up and segue, um, we were asked what our top three hopes are for COP28 and my top hope, I think at the highest level really links back to what Manira was saying or what she ended with, which is um, that this is perhaps one of the few opportunities and few hopes that we have, you know, I, you, like most of us here are probably pretty focused on climate. I know that I am. Um, but if we think about all of the issues that are facing the world right now, the idea of countries coming together and cooperating on just about anything would be a source of tremendous hope, I think, where dealing with several active conflicts that are you know, horrific to read about in the news daily. And many of us have personal connections to one or both or beyond the two that I'm thinking of um, in the Middle East and in Ukraine, um, you know, everything that's going on to sort of tear us apart. And I think that COP is one of these moments where the world comes together. Um, we're seeing, you know, we're, we're hopefully we'll see that happen in Dubai as COP kicks off today. Um, I think that it's really clear that climate change right now is the enemy that all of humanity shares. And a key hope that I have is that our goal of our shared goal, our shared, um, you know, sort of aspiration of addressing it will overcome the differences between nations and will foster um, the kind of cooperation and collaboration that Manira was referring to, because we know that a molecule of CO2 emitted in the global north or the global south has exactly the same impact on radiative forcing and warming, um, no matter where we sit. And so I would argue that climate action is also something that, you know, taking climate action is something that is um, sort of an express, an expression of hope in the international process and in the potential for humanity to cooperate across divergent interests, divergent nations, you know, um, and, and really in a time when I think in many cases uh, and many other geopolitical areas, we're not seeing cooperation. So I guess my kind of highest level right now is just thinking about this as an opportunity because we know that without cooperation, without sharing of innovations, without accelerated diffusion of renewable energy technology, without finance that crosses borders from the global north to the global south, we're not going to address our shared goal. Um, we need to do all of those things. And yet I hope that that shared goal and those shared interests can, can bring our diverse interests together. Um, and I think right now, you know, 
climate change is sort of our best hope at that. It's kind of interesting. It's like the the one the one area where, for example, the U.S. and China are actually um, making progress. Where you know, whereas in other areas we we see tremendous tension. So moving on from that really high level of kind of like <laughs> yeah, this is a the the inspiration. I'm sure that those of you who are uh, will, are going to Dubai or will be playing, paying close attention will will I I think you'll find it inspirational to see all of the flags of the countries there. You know, but beyond that and beyond, frankly, I think it's important, right? Like what that can do to um, to people's motivation and and inspiration to act um, at at a little bit of a lower level, um, but certainly at least as important. My hope is that. The pace and scope of decision making at COP um, and frankly at in you know in all of our governments, whether it's at a national level or at a city level or even you know at a smaller level than that, our institutions, I hope that the pace and scope of decision making starts to come a little bit closer to the pace and scope of science. Um, as Brian mentioned, COP28 will conclude the first, will, will conclude with the first global stock take, which is fancy language for saying that we're going to see an, a, you know, a, 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 a formal assessment of whether the world is on track to meet the goals that was laid out, that were laid out in the Paris Agreement. But we already know we're nowhere near on track. You know, the science, whether or not COP has an official global stock take, Scientists are busy doing global stock takes all the time. And we know from the UN's latest uh, 2023 emissions gap report from the global stock take, uh, the summer since this report of the global stock take technical dialogue, um, which have already been released, we're nowhere near on track. We're headed for something like three degrees Celsius, which as a mother of three young men, I find terribly frightening. Um, and maybe uh, something like 2.5 degrees C if all conditional NDCs or nationally determined contributions are implemented. We know that with our current rate of emissions, we are going to blow through the 1.5 degree C goal in less than five years. So five years of current emissions before we exceed that one point, or at least have a 50-50 shot at, at uh, maintaining 1.5 degrees C. That's not a lot of time. And we also know that as Manira was referring to, we're lagging on adaptation and finance. So Brian referred to that, you know, there, there has been progress for sure. That progress has been nowhere near enough. So we know that when Paris, when the Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015, projections for emissions in 2030 were expected to increase by about 16%. Now they're only expected to increase by about 3%. But what we need to be doing instead is having them fall to about half of what they are today, right? So we're nowhere near the transformational change that needs to happen. So I guess I think a kind of mid-level hope is that this process should come closer together. We should see global stock takes not happening every, you know, 10 years, um, but they should be happening maybe every year. <laughs> they should be happening frequently. And now the global stock take is intended to, will be released at the end of this um, COP and is intended to hopefully ramp up or, or ratchet ambition for commitments um, of the next round of nationally determined contributions, which will be made at the COP in 2025, um, so two years. And again, I would argue that that pace is not keeping pace with what the Earth's climate is doing. So I hope that we can see increased, um, increased ambition and increased um, kind of pace at which that ambition happens. Um, and that brings me to uh, the, you know, kind of, again, reiterating some of the things that have already been said, but really um, what our, you know, key hope is for the language that, or my hope at least, for the language coming out of the decision text in this COP. Um, I think as Brian referred to as well, in COP26, there was uh, talk about, actually, initially the talk was about phasing out coal. Um, but the language that actually ended up being adopted was not phasing out coal, right? It was phasing down 
um, unabated coal. So I guess my hope is for a dramatic increase in the ambition that comes out of this COP in terms of phasing out fossil fuels. Like let's actually do what we need to do and not language that focuses on abating fossil fuels, in other words, carbon capture and storage, which is not going to get us where we need to go, um, or for that matter, offsetting emissions. Because both of those things offer what I think are false hopes that provide, uh, a, a, provide a path forward for those who want to continue, you know, frankly, selling and using fossil fuels um, to the, the, you know, unfortunately, the, the reality that we cannot do that and, and still have a shot at meeting um, our two degree C goal. So I think part of that refers to a renewed commitment, you know, to deep emissions cuts. And again, language that explicitly talks about the phase out or at least rapid phase down of fossil fuels, not just coal, but oil and natural gas as well. Um, and that we're not using uh, carbon dioxide removal or CDR as like a way out. Um, so there's no, you know, there's no, you know, basically put simply, the remaining carbon budget doesn't allow for anything less. And I know the focus will, uh, I'm assuming the focus will be largely on loss and damage, which is critical to bring, um, you know, to to sort of, uh, I don't want to say repair because there is no rep there is no amount of reparations that will repair um, the damage done in the global south to you know based on from emissions that have already happened mostly in the global north, um, but obviously to to help foster a more just transition that will be necessary. But I don't think there's any amount of loss and damage finance that will be able to cope with a world that is headed to three degrees C. We must mitigate, um, we must cut emissions, and we must do so rapidly. And I think another part of this, so I, I um, one of my fears, uh, so kind of hope and fear for COP28, um, one of my fears is that we, you know, again, hope and fear, right? We have seen since um, last year's COP, since the lead, really since COP26 in Scotland, since Glasgow, we've seen a tremendous growth in the number of net zero um, emissions pledges. And we know that something like more than 80%, maybe something as close as 90% of the global economy is currently covered by net zero pledges. But since those pledges have been made, there have also been tremendous, uh, you know, there's there's been rightly uh, strong questioning about how many um, how many of them are actually uh, in good faith and have have meaning, you know, that will actually be implemented and are are trustworthy. And Catherine, do you do you? I just want to take. I mean, I notice that you're. Are we out of time or? It'd be great just to. I mean, I mean, I don't want to interrupt you, but yeah. maybe. Um, sort of draw to a close because we just so we have enough time for questions because we started a few yeah. minutes late, so uh, that'd be just about to just about to wrap up. So just to just to say, my last kind of hope and fear is that for the um, I don't think many people talk about Article Six and the Clean Development Mechanism and how much carbon markets could play a role in whether or not we're successful in meeting our climate goals. Um, but what one of my, so this is, this is for those of you who are already familiar with it, you know, it, it, this is going to be the mechanism, this is the mechanism through which countries in the global north could potentially offset emissions by, um, by funding projects that happen in the global south. And in theory, this is a wonderful opportunity to both, um, you know, cut emissions and also to do so in a way that is just, that, that is more equitable. My worry is that to date analysis, you know, when we sort of put offset offsetting um, projects, um, when we kick their tires, we find out that they they mostly don't do what they're intended to do. And so I worry that we could see um, ambition that is in language only um, through this carbon market mechanism, and that it is wonky enough that people will be looking the other way and it won't receive the attention it deserves. So I'll just end with that. 
that um, my last hope is really for, um, you know, a phase out of fossil fuels that is real. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, I think we've had like three fantastic perspectives and insights into um into you know what we what should be really happening at COP. Hopefully it's uh, hopefully those will things will come across. Um and now we've got some time. We've got um two ways. You've you can we can either use the Slido where if people would like to talk about their three aspirations. So we've heard from our three speakers around their aspirations. So if you'd like to add them in, we can also we'd be happy if you'd like to speak on in the Zoom. We can draw in um draw in your your thoughts there as well if you'd like to contribute. Um, and otherwise, we've got a, a Mentimeter as well, where we can put those things together and see them in a group. So two ways to contribute or three, if you'd like to, to speak as well. Or if, if you've got a particular question for one of our uh, speakers, that's also um, an opportunity for you to, to join. I can't see everybody's um, screen, so. Cool. Hi, Catherine. Yes, so Paul Bolger from UCC. I kick, I kick off with a very simple question for the three speakers. Uh, I think you, most of you have, um, I think you've all been to COP. So if you were uh, Antonio Guterres, um, do you think that COP is fit for purpose? And if not, how would you improve it? Very briefly, yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. I, I can pop in with a couple of thoughts there, although I'm certainly no expert in international negotiations. Um, I think I think there's kind of like, on the one hand, there's the, the strength and the consensus approach where any single country can basically hold the entire negotiation, you know, can grind the entire negotiation to a halt. Um, and also the text that comes out of it, then, you know, there's strength in knowing that there's unanimous support for that text. But I, I, I guess I worry that that could be giving, giving far too much power to countries that want to grind this to a halt, you know, and to result in text that's weaker than it otherwise should be. So I don't know if there's some other process that would ensure, um, you know, that there's a fair process through which countries' voices are heard and we're not relying on um, geopolitical strength in other spaces um, to hear, you know, to make sure that those voices are heard, but to maybe move away from like a completely unanimous, uh, like co completely consensus driven process, because it just seems like the text ends up being weaker than maybe we would hope. But I don't know if others have thoughts. And of course, having more global stock takes, <laughs> having the science be more front and center. Maybe just to add, I mean, two reflections from my side is that that the COP meetings that I've attended are, are phenomenal and frustrating. And the, the phenomenal part comes to something Juliet mentioned earlier. When you look at other topics around the world, you know, we've such division, we, we've such difficulty in coming together to actually discuss never mind agree on topics and if you look at the process uh, that's that's evolved over the last more than 30 years uh, through the UNFCCC I think it's quite unique in that regard and I think that the fact that annually leaders come together there is a circus element to it but leaders come together and it is put up to them and, and the net zero pledges are important. They, they are only a first step, but they are important and they are growing. And we and we are we are in a transition. That that's another thing we often, you know, sometimes can't see as clearly because there's this, you know, we, we see how far off target we are. Um it's it's hard to see how much progress we've made, albeit too slow. And, and I've no disagreement with that. So so it is phenomenal. Uh, it is also frustrating because it's slow moving and the, the points that Juliet mentioned. But it, it, to me, it's both of those things. And that's uh, that's I have a love hate relationship with cops. <laughs> um, just to add that to that, um, to what Brian and Juliet just said, um, I agree. Um, oh, cop is really phenomenal because um, I went to my first COP last year, and that's the, that's the first time I've been to a conference that's not really in my field, like not really uh in my background. Like I, and then you see a lot of people from different background 
or you don't have to be a climate scientist, you don't have to be working in renewable energy to, to go to COP. So I think that, and then it brings a lot of countries that uh, you see countries from the global south and global north just sort of missing together in that in that space. So I think um, it's, it's so filled for purpose, I think, is um, we just need to make sure um, some of the pledges are actually trans translating into actions once they leave uh, the venue of the COP uh, conference. Thank you. Um, Ian, I can see you've got your hand raised. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, so I have another big and provocative question. Huh? So is the COP series reaching the end of its useful lifetime? in that it's becoming more obvious that you can't take climate change as an isolated problem, apart from all of the other problems of inequality, geopolitical tensions, rising um, dysfunction within societies and so forth. So that's my provocative question. Can climate change be addressed as an isolated issue anymore? I, I can give my two cents if that's helpful. Um, I think I think uh, great question. And I mean, I think I think that if you, you know, it's not really being treated as an isolated issue at COP. It's being it's very much treated as something that's connected to other issues. Um, and I think it's still useful to have the COP process, which is focused on climate. So 100 percent agree that um, it's it's it can't be dealt with in isolation, but to have a forum where at least the intention and focus is on climate action, I think is still useful to do. Um, I think maybe having it as under the in, United Nations Environment Program was a mistake at the start of the COP process, um, but now I think it's sort of spread out into more spheres and that's a good thing. Maybe just to add, I think the um, it, it's a great question, Ian. I, I don't have an answer, uh, but I, I I do wonder what such a forum would would look like and what it might hope to achieve. Um, and and it reminds me of there there is a parallel initiative sort of got, gaining momentum to to develop a, a nuclear non proliferation treaty. Um, I, I don't know if the other universities have been if this is a topic that's that's come up, but. Um, I think it's partly because of the frustration with the slow pace of, of progress on this issue at COP meetings. Um, the idea of, of, of setting up something um, different in parallel uh, is emerging uh, as a kind of bottom-up initiative, uh, it seems to me. And I wonder, does that is that the kind of thing that... Um, I... I, I I do struggle to see how that framing, like given that it's taken 30 years, and there is a good question as to whether it's fit for purpose, but there's a, and maybe I've become too institutionalized uh, in, in my perspective on these, but the, 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 the power of having an institutional approach, uh, I think is, is hugely important in bringing countries, holding countries to account. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure what another uh, alternative uh, would look like to to achieve the goals you're you're um, you correctly pointing to, Ian. Thanks. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions in the Slido now, so I'm going to just pick up on those. We've got about seven minutes left. Um, one of them was, "What do you think it would have been better to hold COP?" somewhere else and not Dubai. And that's for any speaker to answer. Bit of a, I think Brian, you you picked, you sort of picked up on that when you first spoke perhaps on that, the, the context of Dubai and what it means to be there. I, I did in terms of the challenges, but but I do actually think it's important that COP move, moves around and, and where else could it go? Um, I mean, if we were to host it in Ireland, it would be embarrassing given that we've the second highest level of greenhouse gas emissions per capita in Europe. Um, equally, if it was in the, the US or the UK, uh, well, it has been in the UK, um, uh, although I think in that case, the UK were hosting on behalf of, of another country. It's, it's, a, it's, 
it, it needs to move around to different parts of the world, but then those difficult conversations about the challenges in each place need to also happen. Uh, so, um, so I'm 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 glad in that respect that it's there, uh, but I'm also glad that there is a light shining on some of the challenges associated with that. If that makes sense, thanks. Julieta Munira, does that do you want to speak to that as well, or um, do you feel <laughs> up to up to you? You don't need to. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a strong opinion about it. I mean, I think there is. I I know that if I were going to Dubai, I think I would be feeling quite a bit of dissonance um, <laughs> between, you know, uh, just the unsustainable nature of, you know, anyway, but I, I, I guess that's just reality. I, I think, you know, Brian's right in that it needs to move around and we need to be shining a light on the different challenges that different regions are facing. Um, you know, as, as, as far as I know, uh, COP29, the decision of where that will be held hasn't even been made yet. So it's a sign of maybe, um, you know, how difficult it can be, right, to move this around uh, to different countries and uh, different regions that are facing challenges. Well, I think we're, we're coming to the last few minutes and uh, in, in the spirit of this, uh, the, the bringing our three hopes and then trying to be more participatory in us in our, and also in the way we're working and obviously drawing in the, the fascinating perspectives we've got from the three um, countries in which people are joining us today, although I have seen, we're, we're broadening out, I've seen Kazakhstan is what someone signing in from, but if if you've got access to the Mentimeter, it'd be really brilliant for people in the last couple of minutes just to include your own hopes. Um, we've got about 30 people, 30 participants on the call. So it would be lovely to see the, the, um, the, different, the different perspectives. Um, and then I might just share the screen so that we can see what's up there already. Maybe that might um, help to... Let me just check I can get the... And this is what we have so far some of the different perspectives but if people in the in the who've joined us today would be happy just to enter their three we can sort of see the different the different ones that people have put in we've definitely got phasing out fossil fuels in there which is obviously in the just energy transition finance for resilience accountability clear actions they seem to have come out with with all of the, the the speakers in the discussion today. Maybe while we're doing that, we've just got one last question, um, which was around um, uh, what the the thoughts were from Glasgow and whether whether things had moved on since Glasgow. So I don't know if one of one of the speakers would just like to speak to that. Obviously, we've had. Sharm El Sheikh since since then, but if anyone would just like to speak to to that uh, transition since Glasgow and what has been achieved since then, and what maybe that enables us to do in terms of reflection, just a brief brief comment before we draw to a close. The the, the one thing I'd mention is that that jumped out at me from Egypt. Now I wasn't there in person. Um, was the um that moved things forward was on lasting and damages. Um, and that and that's. I think a, a key area, but only one key area of, of progress. Um, thanks. Yeah, hundred hundred percent agree with Brian. I was at both in both Glasgow and um, in Egypt, and I think Glasgow was far more focused on mitigation, and um, COP twenty seven much more focused on on loss and damage. So can we bring those two together to see <laughs> just transition mitigation with attention to loss and damage? I guess that's the challenge of COP28. Brilliant. Okay, well, I think um, in, in the interest, I know time we're in different time, time zones, but in the interest of finishing on time, just maybe draw things to a close. Um, really, uh, this has been a sort of an interesting experiment from our point of view of drawing together these three institutions. So we have University College Cork in Ireland, University of Plymouth in the UK, and obviously um, Massachusetts, for Massachusetts. We've got um, Juliet joining us. 
So really pleased to have that sort of opportunity to bring in these, these different perspectives and obviously the expertise and the knowledge we have from these three institutions and the, and they will also be, be have, we, we've all got delegates at COP. So I think one of the things we were looking to do as a sort of a follow on from today's event was to do um, a, 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 a reflect back um, from some of those delegates about what they thought was achieved or not achieved. So perhaps in the early in the spring, we might draw together again our the opportunity to to work together to to bring together some of those delegates to reflect on um, some of the things that have come out of or, or maybe haven't been addressed in COP as they should be. So thank you everybody for joining. Um, it's been brilliant, and um, we we await to see whether COP what will happen out of this 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 year's COP and how how things will progress. Um, thank you for joining, and uh, yeah, look forward to following up perhaps in the in the new year. <laughs>